I have again for another weekly stream. Today we're going to talk about Canadian real estate investing in the United States, USA, Florida, you know, specifically investing in the United States as a Canadian and what it's all about investing in a foreign country and investing, um, how you go about investing in another country, some of the tax stuff related to that. Um, any other questions you guys have, just throw them down below. If you're interested in investing in a foreign country like the Bahamas or you know, Florida, you know, United States or Canada, uh, why Canada, you know, sucks in a lot of ways, specifically Ontario. Ontario is some of the worst, um, you know, some of the worst landlording rules, you know, almost the only other countries I can think of or the only other places I can think of are like states like California. Uh, they, they come close to investing in Ontario. Uh, it really is one of those things where, um, you know, those, those big changes in the way that you look at your portfolio can have big impacts. So let's unpack that today. Um, otherwise, let's talk about some of the interesting stuff in the stock market. Uh, since last week, we've had a bit of a rally. Um, ah, it's traded pretty sideways, but we've now crossed territory where the NASDAQ is up 20% since December. It is now signaling a full bull market. However, we've seen this before in 2001, as an example, before it crashed again at 30%. So we could be in a kangaroo market. It may not be a bull market. We may be bouncing around. I think personally, it's a bear market rally and I think there's more pain to come. Uh, who knows? I'm, uh, I'm shorted as of today. I uh, closed up my longs on the NASDAQ and I went short the NASDAQ. I'm still long, you know, dividend stocks and some other stuff that I, that I play with. But I think that at the end of the day, it comes down to being able to manage risk. And I think there's a lot more downside possible than upside in the short term. In the long term, we've got to be bullish, guys. Like real estate only goes up, stocks only go up, businesses only continue to make profit. Over time, your money makes money. So trying to bet against that is very dangerous. In the short term, it can be a great hedge, it can be great insurance, it can protect some of your overall other assets if you have lots of real estate, potentially shorting, you know, related to interest rates or you know, having some hedging can be a, a great strategy to make sure you can manage risk through a recession. It's one of the tools that I use in my toolbox, but it is again, not my primary investing strategy. We believe in buying the dip. We believe that on those big, big red days when panic and fear are at their maximum, that is when we start take some of the cash we have and start deploying it, right? We want to take advantage of that opportunity. And remember to hold over the long term. Don't dump quality assets just because there's panic in the market. If you believe in a company, if it has great cash flow, you're going to be in a great, great position. Uh, someone says no audio. I don't know. Is there audio? That would be, uh, that'd be strange. I think people could probably hear me, but if you can't, let me know. Um, send a message if, if there's no audio. It could just be something that uh, you're dealing with on your computer there or your phone. Junk says you need 1 million a month. 1 million a month would be nice. I actually have a goal right now in my journal that I, I circled for the start of this year and it was um, it was $100,000 a month passive income. That's a goal for me. I feel like at $100,000 a month of passive income, it's really, really difficult to ever go back to, uh, you know, a, a life of scarcity, uh, of not having enough, right? And I think that that's, well, I wait for people to jump into the stream and get the notification because I am a few minutes late today. People probably jumped on today and thought, where's Mike? And then I was a couple months late. My kids, um, I have three kids and you guys probably know this already, but sometimes kids have tantrums and mine had a pretty big meltdown. So it took me a few minutes extra to get on tonight and that's dad life. And there's nothing more important than, uh, than trying to, to balance family with uh, all of the obligations that we have in our life. But anyway, so any questions about Canada, United States, real estate investing, throw them down below. I'm gonna talk about strategy, but why I'm not leaving Canada yet. I'm still working towards that. The exit return to leave Canada and become, I would keep my Canadian passport, but my long-term goal is to denounce my residency in Canada and pick up residency somewhere like the Bahamas. Um, I haven't narrowed that down 100% yet, but the Bahamas is great because you don't file tax returns. There are no personal tax returns. There's no tax time. You file nothing. Not only do you file nothing, but there are no capital gains tax on crypto stocks. You buy Tesla stock and at 10 X's, you pay no tax. You own real estate, there's a capital gain. Again, no tax, zero, nothing. You rent a property out, you have rental income. You buy a resort, it makes cash flow, no tax. Zero income tax at all, nothing, no filing obligations. That is the beauty of the Bahamas. And you only have to live there 90 days a year, which is like 90 on 365 is what? Like you gotta be there like less than around 25% of the time. So you can spend the rest of your time enjoying uh, all about you know that life of, of travel. So if you love um, Costa Rica, if you love you know United States, for us, like. 
Florida being only 60 miles from the Bahamas, Bahamas seems to be a strong winner. Because again, I can buy a plane and there's there's plane communities you can live in, literally in, in West Palm Beach area where you can fly between, you know, you could have a, a house there with a, a condo corp that has a, a private airport in, within that condo corp. And so everyone just has private planes. You can fly back and forth in like 30 minutes. So that's super key because it's like commuting. You could literally commute every day if you wanted to. You could live in Florida without living in Florida and live in the Bahamas. Or you could work in Florida and then live in the Bahamas and get a visa to do that. And you pay no tax in the United States other than what you earn on the income that you have in the United States. So if you buy a property in the United States and you make income on that, you could set up corporate, corporate structures where the management company could be in the Bahamas. You could hire staff there and they could manage the property. You could bleed out the profit and that corp in the United States could have zero. I guess it is effectively possible to pay no tax from a Bahamas setup, even when investing in Canada or the United States. But if you keep your Canadian tax residency, you want to keep your passport. Canadian passport is super amazing. Uh, you can keep your passport, luckily, as a Canadian, and you can leave and you no longer pay tax. You denounce, you pay an exit return, you value all of your assets in Canada, and you leave, and then no more tax in Canada. You ever want to come back to Canada? You go live there, you get your, your health benefits back, and you start paying tax. It's a choice. You could always come back and do that if you got sick or something. Um, but it's really great because you can have that flexibility. As an American, there's challenges. If they go to the Bahamas, the United States wants you to denounce your past, like you got to lose your citizenship entirely to avoid tax. So that sucks. Um, Canada's great in that way that they only tax you based on where you reside. So if you cut residency ties, you could be four or five months a year traveling in Canada, running your businesses, checking on things, visiting family, you know, vacation, enjoying the whole summer in Canada, in theory. You know, you could be in Canada May to November, almost. Um, maybe not that long, but close to that. And then spend a bunch of time in Florida and go between the rest of the other, the other seven months a year between Florida and the Bahamas. Super close. You just fly back and forth and be residing in the Bahamas and traveling for business and living your best kind of life. So I think that's an optimized system. Um, culturally, there's some really great things, you know, that you can, as someone who's a Canadian, it's very comfortable to go to like Florida or the Bahamas because again, there's pockets of tons of Canadians, right? And you've got that no culture shock. It's all English, um, super easy transition. All the like Scotiabank, it banks in the Bahamas. So if you're already a Scotiabank in, in Canada, you just go open a private banking account in Bahamas with the same bank account, everything. It's just super easy um, being at the same bank and all that. So there's definitely some synergies there. Um, yeah, but I've got this goal. I'd love to, to hit it. I'm working close to it. $100,000 a month, if I could get a portfolio that yielded, say, 12%, that would mean I would need like $10 million at 12% return for 100 grand a month passive. It's actually not that big of a goal. Like These days, 10 million isn't all that much. It's not near as much as what it used to be uh, with the way inflation's been running. It's like, you know, 10 million is really like five. So it's, it's definitely an achievable goal. You know, anyone who really grinds in real estate for five or 10 years can definitely uh, unlock that kind of wealth I think it's fairly easily, especially over a 25 year period. I think it's really easy to compound. If you literally put away like an average salary and bought a property every year for 25 years, you would again, hit that level. So hundred thousand dollars a month is not that hard of a target to hit, uh, especially if you're like a top 5%, top 10% producer over a, a long period of time. Right. But um, that's a goal that I'm, I'm getting close on actually right now. I'm, if I were to do, the thing is that it's not consistent. So like I'll go, I'll go months where it's negative 50,000 cause I'm renovating properties and then negative 50,000, negative 50,000. I'll make 400,000 in a month <laughs> cause I sold the property or I get a big refinance check, a big profit. And then I'll be like negative again. And then I get a huge payout. That's the life of a real estate investor, right? Is like waiting for that next influx of cash. Um, typically you'll have like a large CapEx expenditure come up. And then for a year you're, you're rebuilding that CapEx um, you know, budget in your property. And then you, then you're back to cash flow positive. But people think it's like every month you're getting this money, and it's that's not how business works. It's very difficult to find a business that has that consistent cash flow month for month. There's not any seasonal swings or any, you know, uh, miscellaneous stuff that pops up. So, yeah. David says hello again from Alberta. Haven't heard from you about the NYSE Intel in a while or NYSI and New York Stock Exchange Algonquin. Okay, so you're talking about Intel shares in Algonquin. Um, I have a small holding of Algonquin. I, I think a couple of shares is, is very small amount. Uh, Intel, I also have some shares still. Um, I like Intel. They had a huge spike today. They're, they're a great company. I think that they have a long way to go. There's, um, there is some short-term pain, I think, ahead. I don't think the Fed pivots as soon as the market is pricing in. And so I think we're gonna have some more turbulence um, in the next bit on our way towards that recovery. That's just my thought. I don't know. 
Um, you know, the, the market could be broken. People could not be as resilient as I, I think that they are. And maybe with the Fed pivots early as next meeting potentially pauses, that could happen. And if that happens, that would cause tech to rally. Um, so we are in a bear, we're in a bull market, sorry. Uh, I, I still think the whole overall cycle is still bear. So I think it's more like a bear market rally than a you know, full bull. I think it'll be a long recovery. So you have time if you wanna get in. Probably today wouldn't be the best day. I think there's gonna be times where it'll pull back and you'll have a great entry point. Um, you know, buying at a, a plus seven or plus 8%, you don't chase the highs. You wait for a pullback, you wait for there to be fear, and that's when you buy in. You don't chase the high, you don't go after um, you know, chasing the top because you end up overpaying on those frothy, frothy days. So I'd wait for a pullback if it was me, but I love the company. They're you know, great uh, price to earnings ratio. Wills is officially a member. Welcome, Will. Thanks for becoming a member of the uh, of my YouTube channel. As a shameless plug, I'm gonna throw this out there. There is now a subscription feature with my YouTube channel. You can click right into the YouTube channel and you can get in there and we'll, we'll have some sort of benefits. As an example, you get a special chat um, when we're on the YouTube uh, live. I may have a special stream uh, maybe towards the end of the year for all the members. I'm gonna figure out how to do that so we can have like our own little private group um, for those who, who stick around. So check that out if you wanna, wanna join that. Jazz Raj says, uh, do you think the housing bottom is here in Ontario? I don't know. Um, I think the chance of a huge upside is unlikely. So we will have a, seasonally speaking, every spring we have a huge rip up. So we will have definitely an upswing in, um, in prices coming in in May, right? And then I think December will have a, things will, will come down. So I think buying the hype in May is probably not the smartest. Wait for the summer lull, or more importantly, wait for December, January. Seasonally speaking, in every market in Ontario, there's about an 8% drop in average price. That doesn't mean necessarily they don't find good deals in the spring, because I found great deals before in the spring. Still hunt, but don't get caught up trying to overpay in the spring market. A lot of people get caught up in, in everyone trying to sell in the spring, and they get caught up in all the inventory and all the excitement, and everyone sells um, their house in, in the spring, so there's lots of stuff to buy. People get caught up on that, and they, and they buy it. And then you're competing against all the people, who have, all the families who have kids going to school in August and September, and they want to get comfortable and cozy for the summer. They want to get in, nestled in their new home. So they'll put their house up for sale now, and they'll buy something in May or June once they've sold their house. And so that peak, um, you're competing against a lot of buyers that then fall off in the winter. No one's moving at Christmas. No one's putting their house up for sale when it's dreary and sleet and snow and rain. So that's the time you want to be buying because the houses don't look as good. They don't appraise as well. Um, just in general, prices fall. And so I think if we're going to predict a bottom, it's probably between October and February. Um, more likely narrowed in between end of November and probably January. Uh, will that be 2023, be the bottom of real estate? I don't think so. I think we feel the effects of this in 2024. Um, it's a lagged industry indicator and real estate tends to, to be after the market pivot. So it remains to be seen. I don't know. I continue to buy properties, but not as aggressively um, as I was before. Because again, I would much rather miss out on 5% appreciation than buy something and lose another 5%, right? The, the fear of loss is much more painful for me. And so I'm, I'm all about risk mitigation and that's super important to me. That's why I would say in general, continue if you have some cash, you know, you can buy a couple properties, but don't deploy all your cash right now. There will be more opportunities to get into better deals in the coming months and year, I think. Uh, that's just given past data right? Like 2007, as an example, the bottom of the real estate market after the full collapse came in 2011. The end of 2011 was the bottom of real estate. So if you're in 2008, we're like, you know what? I'm just going to wait three years. I know that real estate, it fell like 25, 30% in most markets. So like we had a big drop. And everyone's like, buy the dip. People who bought the dip actually lost money until 2011. So don't get caught up in the hype and feel like for that next three years, they made nothing. They actually lost some money unless they bought smart, which there was a lot of that that happened. I would have loved to be an investor in 2008. I was just, I'm not old enough for that. But uh, this is my chance, my 2008, I'm hoping. And um, you know, I think Ontario has more pain to come yet. It is possible that we've hit close to a bottom. Do we bounce down a little further? Potentially. Do we trade sideways? Very likely. Are we gonna just rip up again? No, um, I don't think that's likely. Could happen, don't think it's likely. So we'll see. Uh, bum, bum, bum. I was thinking about getting into a pre-construction condo closing 2026. I don't like pre-construction condos all that much because again, you're just speculating. There's no cash flow. These condos are $800,000 in Toronto and they rent for like 3,000 a month. Like there's no way, 4,000 a month, no way. You need 1% rule. So if the condo can set, can rent for, if you're paying 700,000 for the condo, if you can rent for $7,000 a month, then that would be something I would definitely get into. 
back in cash flow, that can make sense. Assuming condo fees aren't insane, but they probably aren't that insane. So in that case, it could make sense. The speculating, it can make sense. Like I've seen investors do it and do really well with it. The challenge is if in 2026, prices haven't elevated a ton, you've tied up money and you're now forced to close on this thing and sell it. It can make sense. Um, I'm not saying don't do it, but I think there are better opportunities to buy stuff that cash flows better than condos. That said, I know people who have done it and made money with it. Um, for me, I don't like condos. I don't have a lot of control. Um, again, I, it's huge condo fees, no control, lack of cash flow. All those things are deterrents for me in general from buying that asset class. But I mean, if you're speculating, right? So the condo you're buying now isn't worth any, like as soon as you sign the contract, there's no value there. The contract's worth the same as what you paid for it. So the only play with that is that between now and 2026, there's an appreciation for that type of condo, um, which like it's possible is depreciation. Imagine you just lose money, close on it in 2026, your cash flow negative, and you can't sell it for more than what you bought it for. That's a possibility, right? And I don't like to get into a business where there's negative cash flow and each property is like its own little business. So for that reason, you know, I don't I don't love it as a as my favorite type of real estate asset class. That's not to say it isn't good, but not my favorite. No problem, happy to help. Rune says, hey Mike, what if we're going towards a fundamental shift in US economics where stocks didn't only go up? Potential change in reserve currency is pretty wild. Rune, yeah, there's definitely talk about right now. And let's let's touch base on that because I think it's important to to discuss it. Uh, there's a dis discussion that the end, the the U the US currency currently is the petrodollar. It's backed pretty much by the US military, but they use it to transact for, it's not just for oil, but oil is one of the main demand drivers for US dollars. And there's now talks of, well, Russia and China have gotten together. They've talked with several countries in the Middle East, including potentially Saudi Arabia and Brazil um, and India. There's tons of these countries, but Brazil, Russia, the Middle East, and China, they produce all the oil um, pretty much. Like they're that's it. There's Canada could produce a lot more, but our government's super liberal and like all about the environment. So like, let's just have the pollution happen in a country beside us so we can feel good that we're not destroying the earth. And it's like the same oil is still being extracted and the world's still getting destroyed. Canada actually extracts oil in a very clean way. So it's better it's extract extracted here. Uh, we're not here, I'm in the US right now, I'm in Florida, but back home in Canada, um, it's better to, I think actually for us to be extracting it, but that's a bad governance issue that I won't discuss in the stream, but they're going to deal in the yuan, the, the Chinese currency, and that will have some real negative consequences, I think, for the U.S. dollar, potentially. Uh, what will happen, more likely than not, is war. Uh, the U.S. is not just going to sit back and be like, yeah, it's all cool. Um, they'll probably manufacture some sort of crisis in the Middle East or some sort of war, um, some sort of proxy war, typically, is the, the way that they would... That's, this sounds super corrupt, but like, just watch. This is exactly what will happen. There will be war. And it's, <laughs> that's how they're going to protect their, the, the dollar. Um, and, and the U.S. military is way stronger than the Chinese military. Like, the technology is way more advanced. And so for that reason, I like this one straight hair, it's like, hit me right in the eyes. Jeez. Um, for that reason, I think that we will see the U.S. dollar remain a strong currency for the foreseeable future. And so I, I'm still long the U.S. dollar, but at these valuations, no. I think the U.S. dollar needs to pull back about 10% before I'm, I'm all in on it. So that's my, my take. I think that, you know, the U.S. dollar could pull back another 5 10% relative to the Canadian dollar. I'd like to see um, the Canadian dollar really gain some strength. It's just been, our economy is just so poorly managed right now under, under Justin Trudeau. It's just, um, oh, it's no wonder that the Canadian dollar has lost a lot of strength, but um I do think there's a potential for a bit of a pullback, but um, yeah, it's interesting to see how that's going to play out. I think that war is more likely, and during war, everyone will just flee to U.S. dollars because it's a safer currency. So, uh, in a bull market, we should see the U.S. dollar um, lose a little bit. So, in coming out of this bear market, we will have a time where there'll be a, several factors that will push strength um, for, or sorry, weakness for the U.S. dollar. So. That could be an opportunity if you're looking to invest in the United States as a Canadian or as a you know foreigner, buying your U.S. dollars could be uh, potentially could have a win there. I could be totally wrong, by the way, and we could you know there could be full-on war tomorrow in Ukraine and uh, between Ukraine and Russia or something, and the United States steps in and all of a sudden everyone just flees to U.S. dollars again, or or the market collapses. It's directly correlated with as the market goes down, the U.S. dollar gains strength. 
relative to the Canadian dollar. Uh, just in general, the U.S. dollar gains strength in times of, um, you know, crisis, right? The banking crisis. It will continue. There are more doors to, to knock on yet. I don't think we're completely done with this crisis. So, uh, again, the coming from just like just December to now, the Nasdaq's up over 20%. I think that that's a great bull run. We've had a fantastic run. Today, I put shorts back on. So I'm shorting the NASDAQ. That's that's because I believe we're going to have a pullback. Are we going to re retrace those lows that started this year in, in January? I don't know. Um, are we going to test new lows? I don't know. Um, maybe, maybe not. Are we going to pull back from 313 on the QQQ that we saw today? Probably. I think we'll probably retrace down to close to 300, even if we're in a to, now a bull market. There's going to be opportunity for that. So don't feel like... Like that fear of missing out is dangerous because it gets us into investments that potentially don't fruit bear as much fruit because we're focused on just like, oh, I don't want to mess out, I don't want to mess out. And that's something to be, be afraid of, I think. Um, from a structure perspective, when you're investing in in the US, you would set up like a, I said I would share this on the stream today for someone was messaging me and asking me if today I could share a little bit about that. But the the best structure after talking to like half a dozen lawyers, for the if you're going to stay a Canadian resident, and you don't want to be double taxed. You need to get a credit for all the tax that you pay in, um, you know, in the U.S. You're going to have a U.S. LLC that's going to roll up into a like a Nevada or a Wyoming C corp and LP GP structure. And the GP is going to be like 0.1 percent, and the LP is going to be like 99.9 percent of your portfolio, uh, or of the ownership of sorry said LLC, which is then owning the properties. And every so many properties you will open another, if it's in Florida, another Florida LLC, which will fold up into the LPGP structure, which can then be owned by your Canadian corporation or yourself personally, depending how you wanna do it. If it's an active business, like Airbnb is considered an active business with management. Um, if you're flipping, if you're doing an active business, you'll get active business treatment from a tax perspective back in Canada. And so then it would make sense to have that structure flow back into your business in Canada. Again, lots of ways to set it up. Talk to a professional. I can recommend you guys some great people to, to do that. But it's really not an expensive structure to set up. And then you're protected from a liability perspective. You're protected from double taxation. So all the tax, like in, in Florida, the federal tax in the U.S. is like 25%. So you're going to pay 25% tax. People have this like myth in their head that like Florida is tax-free. It's state tax-free. But even the state like LLCs still have tax. There's, there's still tax. Um, it's better than Canada because Canada is like 50% passive income tax and actually 55 percent in some cases uh it's better but it's not completely tax-free so i just want to get that through people's heads florida is great though as an example because you can go and just jump the run up as much as you want it's a lot like alberta in that way um so there are some great things about florida that i really like again it is really one of those things where um for me it's about building a resilient diversified real estate portfolio that fits the lifestyle and i just like there's some really good demographic trends for investing still in ontario we have a lot of immigration a lot of foreigners and they come into ontario to be with people who are their family and their friends and we have a really good mix of ethnicities in and around the toronto area as an example even london's getting a lot more diversified and that's good because we're going to draw more and more immigrants there'll be an issue where supply demand is out of balance it will drive housing um, to new levels canada has a million new people that immigrated um, that's like three four percent of our population in one year if we keep that up half of canada is going to be immigrants in the next like 10 15 years so that's that's good canada's growing we're one of the biggest countries in the world we have some of the most natural resources it's it's a beautiful country it's a beautiful topography it's got bad management but it's a beautiful country with a lot of opportunity so for that reason i love canada i'll always have a portfolio of real estate in canada i probably won't reside in canada long term more than likely i love florida I love the, the culture in Florida. I love the capitalist mindset. I love that there's like a thousand different buildings for sale that are, you can negotiate on, whereas in Ontario, you have like two opportunities to negotiate on. There's just less. And the cap rates make way more sense here. In certain parts of Florida, you can literally get like 80,000 a unit. In central Florida, you can get 50,000 a unit. They have 40. If you go like northern central Florida, you could buy a 100-unit hotel for like 2 million bucks. million bucks. Like it's crazy how cheap. Like you could buy a 50 unit apartment building for like a million bucks. Like in Toronto, that'd be like 20, 30 million for something like that, where you can buy it in central Florida for like the cap rates are insane in some areas. Um, not, desi not as desirable areas, but it's definitely, that's one of the drivers is the cap rates are so strong in many pockets of Florida and the environment, the business environment is very landlord friendly, very property owner rights, strong, 
um, just in general, like lending practices are more relaxed here. It, it's a lot of things going for, for Florida. Culturally, it's it's got a lot of snowbirds, so I like that there's pockets of people and I can build that tribe around it. And I, I can do real estate in any country. I, I really could. I could develop a competitive advantage and build a business in any country in the world, and I could thrive doing it. I know that I have that skill set, and you probably watch this, have that skill set too, and you could definitely choose any country to invest in. It's better to invest in a country where there's positive factors working for you, right? Um, demographic trends, people are moving to Florida. They like the culture here, specifically with you know, the, the governance that's been set up in, in Florida and some of the political stuff that's been going on. But moreover, the weather, it's just, it's beautiful all the time here. And that's something that's, that's attracting people from you know, the colder states like New York or Canadians to come down south. And so I, I like Florida. It's the most southern tip of the United States. Beautiful, close to the Bahamas. For me, that trifecta of Canada, Bahamas, and Florida, that triangle is going to be perfect. I want, I want properties in all those places. I want to build portfolios that are resilient in all of those places. So for me, that's, that's the big fit. But there are many drivers behind that beyond lifestyle, beyond the fact that I think that other people will see this too. And I'm, I'm maybe early on this on this triangle, uh, but I'm hoping that over time people are going to see this, and they're going to, my followers are going to see this, and we're going to be able to build a community. In as an example, Freeport is an island that has no property taxes; it's property tax free. So you've got, and they they have some really cool advantages where again you don't pay any tax. So if we could set up a a community down there, or maybe we buy a resort together, or we build a, a condo community, all of us own different condos, and we all rent them out and, and create cash flow, and have this this utopian society for the winter months between there and Florida, and we have airports in both places, we could fly back and forth. We could have someone who's a pilot fly a 10 person or 12 person small private plane back and forth. We could have flights going once a week back and forth and set up this utopian society. And just like the Great Lakes in Canada, some of the freshest, largest fresh water in the world, beautiful. Like there's nowhere else I'd rather be in the summer than in Canada, but I don't want to live in Canada year round. It's just not a beautiful place in the winter. Uh, and the tax climate is not good. And the government is very socialist. So there's, for someone who's a high producer who wants more out of life than just, you know, the bare minimum, uh, you know, just pay 60% of what you have to the government and work your whole life, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's not as desirable. All right, I'm gonna do some Q&A here. Let's blast these out. Uh, do you think, okay, I'll answer that question. The next one was, um, hey, dude, how's it going? Do you have benefits, like, in a job by being a millionaire or by being multiple millionaires? So, no, you you you'd have to have your, like as a business owner, you can go buy yourself private health insurance. You can negotiate something for your employees and yourself. Um, but you can just go buy private health insurance if you want. I just pay cash when something happens. Currently I'm protected by OHIP. Like I pay, I pay a quarter million dollars a year and, and I probably owe right now over a quarter million dollars in tax coming this April in like a couple weeks, I'm going to pay a quarter million bucks to the Canadian government and income tax at provincial and Canadian government, I guess federal and provincial, probably over a quarter million, maybe more of my corporations. And it's probably half a million this year. Um, I don't know. I haven't done the math yet, but we're going to find out. The accountant's going to give me the, the bill soon, the damage. But uh, yeah, I mean, I pay a lot. So I have health benefits. And it's definitely something that um, <laughs> the health benefits are, uh, they do cover you to an extent. Like you can take a hospital bill and apply it to, um, to OHIP, I think. And Ontario Health Coverage will cover it when you're in Florida to a certain percentage. And if something big happens, they'll cover it too. So for now, I just pay a ton of tax and that's my insurance. But as I, if I shift to the Bahamas, let's say as an example, I would just buy private health insurance. Um, but I would buy health insurance with a really high deductible. So like if it's anything under $10,000, I just pay for it myself in cash. So I would self-insure. But if something major happens, it's like a huge amount, like $50,000 bill or something, you fly in a helicopter and like have massive surgery. then it's obviously important to have that backup insurance for those worst case scenarios, right? And that's something that I would consider uh, in the future. It's darn hair, you're blowing the wind. Next question. Uh, bum, bum, bum. Thanks for hosting. Any tips to keep a basement budget? I could do a whole video on how to keep rental budget down. Like I could build a whole course just on rental management and keeping costs down. But like high level, look to buy materials on sale. Um, use Amazon to buy as much as you can. Plumbing fixtures, like light fixtures, um, faucets, cabinets, furniture, everything can be delivered to your house for free in like one or two business days using Amazon. Amazon is fantastic. I started, instead of going to Lowe's or Home Depot, I now go to Amazon for like plumbing fixtures, for lights, for like my rental materials are coming from Amazon because you can buy a PVC plumbing drain as an example for like $3 on Amazon. 
and it's $15 at Home Depot. It's a 500% markup to buy your stuff there. So a lot of idiots are still buying at Home Depot and Lowe's. They don't know any better. Um, and so that's definitely not what you wanna be doing. Use Amazon, get your materials way down. Uh, and you can, within Amazon, like the first thing you click on, you have a light fixture that's 50 bucks. You go down, look for similar items and you scroll through, you'll find light fixtures for 25 bucks. But you gotta look, know how to hunt. Amazon's not gonna refer you to the, the lowest margin stuff. They're gonna give you the high margin stuff. So you gotta know how to dig through their site and get through their SEO to find the good deals and the good quality stuff and just know what you're buying know your prices, that'll help a lot. On the labor side, try not to do job price for most of the job. Like flooring is easy, painting is easy, get really affordable job prices. Get three, four, five quotes, have them compete against each other. The cheapest quote wins as long as they meet your criteria. Um, be careful with the cheapest quote because sometimes you get hacks that end up costing you more time and money. But in general, I would say multiple quotes, super important. Look for people that will meet your certain criteria. Never, ever advance money before the work is done. Never prepay labor. That is the biggest thing you can do to save money. I can't tell you how many times I've been burned where we've advanced labor. Do not advance labor. Offer to buy materials yourself to save up money and advanced labor. If it's with them daily, you say, hey, you can't, you can't float it for the week to get paid at the end of the week. I'll pay you daily, but I will not pay you ahead of time. I've been burned before. You just say that. And a good contractor is okay with that. They won't take, like, they're not gonna be worried about getting burned on one day's labor. You pay them every day and it's a win-win. What you don't want is a contractor is going to take money up front and then disappear. Or they're taking money up front from you to finish another job. And you don't want that. You don't want that kind of contractor in your life. Um, but in, in general, hourly contractors win out over job price for most tasks. Like it might be, you know, $5,000 to put in a kitchen. I can hire a guy for $25 an hour and in a day and a half, he can put a kitchen together. So it costs like $500 in labor maximum to put, a, put all the kitchen cabinets in. But a company will charge you $5,000. That's 10x, it's a thousand percent markup because the general contractor's making money. He's got set three, four employees. I found that three guys on site, never good. One or two. One guy for two weeks can do more than two guys can do in one week. Almost always. You put three on site and that third guy's just draining salary. He's there to make things go, that third guy should make things go 33% faster, but it doesn't. That third guy makes the job go like 10% faster. And it feels like it's getting done a little bit faster, but their extra salary is almost never justified. You have multiple people, you, it creates bottlenecks. So I like to have, I like one good painter or two good flooring guys, like one guy cutting, one guy laying. A two person team goes way better than like bring four and five guys in and everyone's you know, disarray. And then you got two people sitting around waiting for the next guy to work so they can keep working. It just isn't, um, those are tips for efficiency. There's a million more tips up in this brain. I can't think of them right now, but from a cost control perspective, your labor and your material inputs are the largest inputs to consider. Um, don't drag the project on too long. It's important to keep things moving every single day. So that's something that like, I would consider. It's like, I would never take a day off on my site. There's always something happening on the site every day. I try to block in so that someone's working, something's happening on the site every day, even if it's a little thing moving forward. Because if you take breaks on sites, I've seen people take a year, two years to do flips where they're doing a lot of the work themselves and the carrying costs can be huge because then you've, you've lost the opportunity cost of all that rental income. So don't delay the project so much in the pursuit of trying to save money. But saving money is important um, as well. It's like a one-two punch, but you wanna use both levers. Hope that helps. All right. Next question was, do you follow someone or are you part of a mastermind for stock investing? I'm not currently part of any mastermind for stock investing. Um, do I follow people? I follow tons of people in the space that are, um, that talk about you know, trading and, and um, you know, I follow some bulls, I follow some bears. I see a lot of people that are bullish in the market and I look at some of the data and I'm like, I don't feel as bullish. The reasons why people are super bullish, I'm like, like the, a lot of these guys are messaging me like the technical analysis says we're like ripping up. And I'm like, of the five valuation methods, technical analysis, TA, is the least reliable. It's okay for entrance and exit on a trade. It can be used to help you, but it's not to be relied upon for future value. What the stock, value, what the stocks did yesterday doesn't really dictate what they're going to do tomorrow. It definitely doesn't dictate underlying value of companies. Financial analysis, super important. There's a lot of gambling going on in the space. And so be careful in the stock world. I try, even with my shorts, to never have them on for a long period of time to avoid getting burned. Um, I've been shorting all this year, since January, uh, mid-January. I was long the first two weeks of January. I made a bunch of money as the market went back up. And I said, look, as it got to like 295, I was like, okay, I, I feel like there's not a lot of upside here. And I started shorting. I'm up 4.5% year to date on that, in that shorting portfolio. 
the shorts that I follow the benchmark is down 40% shorting over this period, two to one, right? So like, that's because I'm in and I'm out. So I will, like, I went short today. And if I'm wrong over the next two days and the market continues to run, I will continue to cut, cut my losers. You got to stop loss. It's really, really important. And remember that long term, I want to be focused on being bullish because bullishness heals all wounds. By, by that, I mean, like, if I'm long the market, I will always win. If I buy the market and it dips 10%, it will come back. If you short the market and it rips 10%, it might come back. But in the long term, you're always going to lose shorting. So short, if you're going to short, it needs to be to protect other long assets as a hedge or for a short duration of time. And you need to cut losses quickly and take profits when you can take profits. So um, I don't know. I, again, I subscribe to the idea, and mostly because it's rooted in data, that you cannot predict the market. And you cannot beat the market net of fees, like trading fees, and the time, of your, the time value of your money over the long period of time. We may try, I, I may beat the market for a while, and if I get ahead, I gotta stop and just buy the index because you cannot outperform the market for a 25 year period. No one, like there are almost no traders over the long term who outperform the market. So that's why it's important that if you're gonna trade and you're gonna wheel the options index, wheel the index in the long direction. So, you know, buy the index at a 2% discount by selling puts and then get assigned and you're long the index and then say, hey, I'm okay to, to sell calls on, on this index that I'm owning, this basket of stocks get them called away. And then if they get called away at 10% profit, you made a 10% profit. That's okay. You, the strategy like that, you will never lose big. So I like really running the wheel in the right direction over the long period of time. You will always win. Uh, don't apply a ton of leverage. Own the indexes on a small piece of everything. If you're going to run options, you can get discounts on shares. When things are really chaotic, sometimes you can get four, five, six percent uh, discounts. Um, someone just asked what ETFs I hold. I have a dividend portfolio that's like individual names of stocks. And I've shared that before in my stories. That's a long-term portfolio. I also have another portfolio now that has some bonds in it, which is rare. I, I hate bonds, but for once I'm like, bond yields are pretty strong right now. Um, so I've got a little bit of bonds in that portfolio. Um, again, the loan to value is really nice on bonds. You can borrow 90% loan to value against your bonds. So if you have a million dollars in quality, like fixed income type funds, the bank has a line of credit on my stock portfolio and will lend me back 90% loan to value on those bonds. So that's kind of interesting if I need access to that liquidity. Um, that's part of why I started to incorporate that. But my main portfolio, I like to follow SPY, SPY. Um, it's not, it's an ETF that follows the S&P 500. That's one that I would hold long-term. Um, there are several other ones you could hold long-term. I trade SPY over other ones that are lower fee because I use, there's a lot more options volume. So I'm tending to wheel the options. So even though I'm long the market, on bad days, I will sell puts. If things continue to go down, I'll get to sign those shares. I'll own the SPY, the index. And I'll, on good days, I'll sell covered calls on that. And I'll rotate that. And so will I beat the market? I don't know. But I know that I can, if, if the market's down 2% today, in the fear and panic, at the worst of it, I can probably sell contracts for next week to buy at a 6% discount at, of the current S&P 500 price. So to me, that's like the worst case scenario is I have to own the index at a 6% discount of where it's currently trading. And over the long term, you'll always win with that. Because five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, we're gonna be in a position where like, just look at what AI is doing right now. Um, even like some of what's been going on with the, the advancement of technology has forced us into a point of increased efficiencies to the point where like capital is now becoming more valuable than labor inputs for the first time ever. Because now capital can produce more net efficiency than an hour of, of labor can. So capital is gonna become more and more valuable in the time to come with robotics and AI, I think we're gonna get more efficiency for less dollars. And so that increased output, more GDP out of our economy, especially in the United States where you know, we're heavily fococused on tech. Like I say we, I'm not, even, I'm not even a US citizen, but in the US they're heavily focused on tech. And um, I think that's gonna play out really well. Somewhere like Russia, they're not investing heavily in tech. Even China is not really investing as heavily in tech, I don't think as, um, the US is known for their some of their cutting edge tech. And so I think that, that will help keep them a superpower into the long term. From a, a market fundamentals perspective, the, if the markets will continue to become more efficient and that will drive further growth. I think we may see in the next 10 years, like what happened in the dot-com bubble, it's a very similar, a lot of parallels between what happened in dot-com and the internet and what's happening now with AI and you know the whole, um, I guess, part, partly related to the chip shortage too, because you need chips to to transition to a, a smarter, more efficient economy. And I, I like in some ways 
that it can be more efficient. So if you don't own the index and you're not a capital owner that owns a percentage of this tech, as these businesses implement this tech and lay people off because they don't need those people anymore and we have to retool our brains to become users or what you call an AI whisperer. If you're an AI whisperer, if you know how to run prompts into AI to get it to do things, then you'd be valuable, right? And so that's how we're gonna have to retool our society. But a person will now be able to produce much more. Just as in the 1990s, they said, everyone's gonna get fired because computers are gonna take over everyone's job. Well, we just used computers as a tool. We're gonna use AI as a tool, right? Uh, and I think that will allow us to produce more. Computers let us produce what five employees could produce, now one employee could produce, and we got way more efficient. That's how we're able to drive more value into, the, into GDP and into the economy and how these businesses became more valuable. Over time, I think that will continue to happen in the next 10 years. There's gonna be a crazy bull run. Like an insane bull run is coming in the next decade. It will take me, I'm hoping to 100 million over the next little while. So don't miss out on the opportunity to be investing in tech and in, in real estate too, to be honest. Um, but just, just getting into the market is super important. All right. Uh, next question. Someone who does not have a lot of capital, say $250,000 in savings. That's great, by the way. It's not nothing um, for down payment. How much capital could you look to put in real estate in the next few months versus waiting for November, December? Yeah, I mean, if you don't have as much capital, Andrew, I think that we're talking about investing in REITs um, as a place you could invest without having the down payment. But you could also put your time in and build a small side hustle real estate business where you know, you're buying properties and you're bringing money partners on. You don't even need money to buy real estate. You just need to have the skills. And if you have the skills to buy and you want to put the time in, well, then your time has value. And so that's super important, I think, for uh, building out a real estate business. So you could definitely invest in real estate, excuse me, invest in real estate without having a ton of capital. You could look to partner with other people and that's how you could scale your portfolio. But yeah, I would say don't, if all you have is one down payment, you're looking to buy one property, look for a really good deal. Like if the, if the best deal way under value, hits you in the face now, awesome, buy it. Who cares if it's at the peak because it's a great deal. I think there'll be more of those kinds of deals you'll find in December of this year, um, into the slow season. So uh, that's my thesis on this. Have you or always do you get construction permits? It holds up so much time. So it depends. Um, I have a project right now as an example where we took a roof off the house and put an addition on and tried to duplex and it's been a two-year renovation. The engineers and the city went back and forth for nine months where nothing happened, stop work. So I know exactly what it's like to battle the permits. Uh, I've got lots of experience with that too. Where I can, I try to find projects where, as an example, in Ontario, if you're doing flooring, painting, um, a vanity change out, and you're not changing the plumbing, you're just you know, taking the vanity out, putting a new vanity in, taking the toilet off, putting a new toilet back in, changing the trim out, um, even, on, even windows, if you don't change the size of the window in Ontario, no building permit required. Uh, doors, if you're not changing the opening, not changing the header, no permit required. Kitchen cabinets, you rip the kitchen cabinets out, put new kitchen cabinets in, put granite in, new appliances, no permits required. So you can do a lot. As long as you don't touch uh, the insulation and the walls in any way, any structure, you don't need permits. If you're not trying to change the use of the building in any way, you're buying something and you're working with what's already there, that's the better way to go. I now avoid any big projects. I don't even touch them because at the time value, I could do 10 projects that don't require permits in the same time as a flip that required permits. And just the aggravation and, and the risk factor, because they can say no a lot, they can go back and forth and change their minds. It's one inspector wants one thing, another inspector wants another thing. Just, it's a whole bunch of extra cost. I try to avoid those projects now. I've been down that road, I fought those battles, and now I just avoid them. Um, so it, by and large, I try not to do stuff that requires permits. Um, that's my new motto is just avoiding any projects that are big. So I, and if I do, like we have one project where I'm gonna have to build a garage. I'm gonna pull a permit for that. Like, you can't build a garage without a permit. Like, you have to do things properly and always try to follow codes to the best of your ability. Get an engineer in there to help you with the, the drawings and then get to pull the permit if you're gonna do that. It's gotta be a very fruitful project for it to make sense to do it. And garage builds are nice in comparison to a house build where you've got like 20 inspections. A garage builds like you throw it up and you're done. Chinook says, uh, maybe on the note of war, but investing in defensive stocks like DFEN ETF would be a good idea, potentially. Yeah, potentially. Um, I take a look at that one. I haven't seen that one, but yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> with some of the talk right now, I think that's a potentially good hedge. Um, yeah. 
Condos are not a great investment considering that you're at the mercy of the condo court board and management and I have had to do renovations or if they are managing the building poorly, you are a result of all that. Yeah, exactly. 100%, I, I echo all that sentiment and agree. What are your thoughts on the 2023 budget and how it will impact Canadian real estate investors and landlords? Um, I haven't studied it, to be honest, David. Um, in general, the the quick you know couple of, of posts I've seen about it, uh, they're spending too much, as always. Um, you know, our deficits are running up. That should you know, create some inflation, which should drive real estate prices up. Uh, we're, there was also a huge budget to support it, a lot of the, the support systems for the million immigrants that Canada's taking in and continues to take in each and every year. We're taking a ton of immigrants in. So that's really bullish for Ontario real estate. Florida's the same thing. Everyone's moving from West Coast to East and South down into Florida. So that trend is really good for real estate because we don't have enough supply to meet demand and that creates a rise in price, which is what you want um, as a real estate investor. So the demographic trends are good. Um, the budget, they're spending too much. Of course, taxes are gonna rise. I need to get out of Canada before I get taxed out the ass. I'm sure they're gonna have to raise taxes again. It's like, you know, you, you make a dollar of income, you tax on it, you buy something, you, you transfer that money to someone else, they pay tax on it again. Um, also, there's 13% sales tax, every single good and service that sells. And then there's property taxes, and there's vehicle taxes, there's tax on the gas, there's tax on the stuff that you're buying. You're taxed 10 ways to Sunday, most of your money's gone in Ontario, unfortunately. So it's just, um, you've got to set up a good corporate structure. You've got to learn how to use write-offs. It's super important to manage all of that, um, manage that tax liability down. If you're starting investing in Canada, would you invest in Alberta versus Ontario? Um, I like Alberta. The thing I don't like about Alberta is it's very tied to commodity prices, but Alberta is a much better province to do business in than Ontario. Um, if I could start again, I go to Alberta, 100% over Ontario. But, Ontario is just so beautiful. Like being on the Great Lakes and having like a nice cottage portfolio is just, it's amazing. Like I would never want to live in Alberta. Like living in Alberta would be kind of kind of crappy, I, I think, in comparison to being on the Great Lakes, like the beautiful, and I have family too, and I grew up in Ontario on the Great Lakes. So like for me, there's some, you got to come, you got to see it, you got to experience it. And it's just a beautiful thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with Alberta. It has some really great um, laws. I plan to make a trip out there. I'll be driving out to Alberta. I have a friend's wedding I'm going to in, in BC in June. So I'll be driving out. If anyone's watching this and you live along the way, I'll come all the way through. We're going to drive across Canada. So I will drive through like Winnipeg, um, all the major cities, all the way out there. And so I'll be stopping in Edmonton to check out some properties there. I might even pick up a building or two making use of that trip on the way. And then going to hang out with some friends in, in uh, BC for a bit in Vancouver. Maybe go to some of the islands there. And then we're gonna drive back. So um, yeah, if anyone's around May, June, along the path out west or back, hit me up. I might stop in and say hi. Aiden says hi, Mike. No questions this week. Just glad I caught the live stream. Thanks, Aiden. Good to see you on. Glad to see you're doing well. Andrew says, are you still taking mentees? Uh, yes, it's coming. It just isn't a priority right now about when I'm gonna launch this said program and add that to my to my work list of things I have to do in a day. Family's number one, right? Like I spend most of my time with my family and um, the eight hours a day that I try to budget for building business and growth and all that, um, that's pretty full. So I'd have to finish off some current projects and then I can do it. So I've got some projects here in, in Florida and a couple in Ontario that are wrapping up soon. And when that calendar opens up again and I can honor that commitment, I'm going to. Um, I probably have 10 of you guys that have messaged me. And so if it's like, say it's 18 grand for a year of membership and we, we all do a deal together. That means I, and I bring on 10 students. It's 180 grand we bring in revenue and then we partner on a bunch of deals. It could be a great source of, of a sustainable business where I could bring coaches on and some of my mentees could become coaches. We can coach more people. We can build a big network of real estate investors that are achieving success, right? Um, and so that's what I want. I would love to do JVs with a lot of my mentees and, and teach them what I know and, and coach them through that so that we can do deals together. I can put my money to work with them and put it in good hands and people that know how to invest the way that I invest. And that's, that's epic. Like I'm, I'm looking forward to, to building an army of, of equals of, you know, uh, champions who want to go out there and, and grind and build real estate businesses that I can then be a part of as well. And so for me, that's a, it's on the list of things I'm, I'm going to do. So definitely, uh, definitely on the list of things I got to do. Okay. Next question was, I saw you doing daily Spanish lessons on Duolingo. I knew that for more for my daughter, um, but I am I'm doing daily Spanish lessons. Um, yeah, it's great. I love Duolingo. 100 day streak's awesome. I'm like 60 days or something. 
Uh, next question was, where is the next question here? There it is. Yuri says, hi, Mike. Uh, why would you not go the same route as me? Kevin does with house hack startup. It seems to be similar to what you've done in the past with JVs. What are your thoughts? And can he do it? Kevin is a, is a monster. Um, just in general, like guy's a workaholic and like I have mad respect. I could never compete with his level of work ethic. He works like 16 hours a day, every day. Um, I would miss my family too much. I'd miss my free time too much. I, I just couldn't keep up with his level of work ethic. It's just unreal. Um, but yeah, I, I think the same way he does, we, we have a similar mindset, I think, when it comes to investing. The challenge I think I have is that I don't have the reach he does. I don't have the network that he does. And it's very expensive to set up something like house hack. And I don't have the wealth that he does, to be honest. Like he's, we were maybe equals for a while, but I'm sure Kevin has like a hundred million in net worth now. So he's, he's 10 X me now. And so he just has more everything than I do. And the cost to set that up is like a quarter million dollars, probably in legal fees, maybe a half a million. I don't even know, probably a half a million dollars to set it all up. So could I set up a fund? Yes. Will I set up a fund at some point? Yes, it will come. I'm just not there yet. And some of that's mental. Some of that's just like, I don't have enough deal flow right now. I don't have the teams built to do something like that yet. I don't have the capital raising ability that he does. Like his network is just huge, right? But yeah, something like that will come. There will be a Rosar Capital Fund at some point that you'll be able to invest in. Um, we'll probably raise half as, or a quarter as much as what Kevin's doing, but someday it will get bigger over time. And I'm confident that I'm a good finder of deals and that would be an area that I would niche into. That would be the area that I like. I like hunting for deals. And so that would be something that, yeah, I probably will have a fund at some point. Ideally, it's more of a private fund where I'm not, I'd like to not be accountable to the investor on each individual project. How do I say that? I'm accountable to the investor, but I don't want to have one investor for one project. I want a hundred investors that are investing in all of my projects and the overall yield gets paid out a fixed return to the investors with some variable upside based on performance. And I'm not, we just have a pool of capital and I can hunt and do whatever I want with it. There's no investor I have to please or like, do we take this deal and we not? It's, it's my call and we move on. So that would be the ideal type of fund that I would set up. But again, those funds are very expensive to set up and they're expensive to manage. You gotta be doing a lot of volume for it to make sense. If you just do like five or 10 deals, it doesn't make sense to have these funds because it's a quarter million dollars to set it up and tens of thousands of compliance with SEC or whichever other um, bodies, you're, depending on how you register it in Canada or the United States. But definitely... Um, in the long term, it makes sense to do it, and I, I should, I probably will, uh, but not right now. Again, I'm, I'm torn. Some days I wake up and I'm like, if I literally sold everything today and just did like a Rosart Capital private lending firm, and all I did was just fund deals as a lender, and I just took like a, a 12% yield, let's say, and maybe I set up a division that had some consulting so I could consult on projects, and maybe I set up a division that does the appraisals on, on the evaluation and all the properties and projects we lend on so I can make a fee on every deal we funded. It's like, David, welcome to the Rosehart Private Access. Um, thank you for becoming a member, that's super awesome. It's the first step um, to unlocking more private access to me and eventually into some sort of private stream or, or mentorship potentially. So thank you for, for purchasing that, that's cool. YouTube, uh, just go to my website and you'll see it. Um, sure, I'll make you a moderator, why not? Let's see if I can do this here. There, I made you a moderator. Um, welcome. Now, um, I lost my train of thought there. I don't even know what I was saying anymore. Lost the train of thought. Next question. It's a good strategy to turn $500,000 into $3 million in, in four years. It's actually not that hard to do. Um, the way you would do that would be finding deals that are really well valued, undervalued. And so they're really well priced and getting in there and adding value to those deals, then selling them or refinancing them and recycling the capital onto the next one. As an example, if you have $500,000, you take $500,000, you buy a property that's $500,000 or $450,000 and 50,000 in renovations. And that $450,000 property is now worth $700,000 when it's done. Offer closing costs and fees, you're into it for say not 500, but let's say 550. You sell it for you know 700, you have some closing costs, 650, you made 100,000 profit. You now have $650,000 cash after deal number one. Then you take that and you buy two more and maybe get some better financing on one of the deals. So you take hundred grand that you just made your profit and you roll it into financing on deal number two. So now that's what you've tied up in that property. It's now producing cash flow for you. Over time, you'll get appreciation over the four years. 
then you'll buy another property, do the same thing. You'll flip or you'll burr. And the burr idea is just that you increase the value in the property, you put a new mortgage on it, you take out your money, and you're on to the next deal. Hopefully the deal can produce enough cash flow that you then are able to um, you know, take that, that refinance and buy another property and keep the snowball going. But yeah, you would have to, it would have to be a full-time aggressive business, I think, to take 500,000 to 4 million. You'd have to be really putting in uh, a full-time effort into finding deals, managing them, keeping the costs down so you get that maximum refi with as little inputs as possible. You'd be there on site watching the, you know, the properties and the projects. To completely outsource it would take a lot longer. Your returns go down as you outsource, right? It's more enjoyable to have like, you know, outsource to the construction, not have to worry about anything. Like to make it truly passive, cash flow drops significantly and operating profit from flipping also drops considerably. So a lot of the way that you get maximum profit is by leaning in and making your time investment to grow the yield. Anyway, I got to wrap this stream up. I'm way late. I started late today and I'm way past. David, you have to link up with me on socials and we'll uh, see if we can connect. Free unit in Calgary for you if we have availability during your trip. Yuri, send me an email. Um, I think we'll be going through there in June and then coming back maybe towards the end of June, beginning of June, end of June. Hey, Super Chat. Thank you so much for the Super Chat, Anthony. Really appreciate it. Uh, it says, what are some of the best ways to negotiate cash for keys? What is the going rate to get someone out? So the rule of thumb I have when I'm trying to get someone out, uh, if I don't want to go the legal route and I want to try to get them out just cash for keys, first thing I'll do is go there and say, hey, um, you know, if their rent is, say, $1,000 a month, I might offer them $1,000 to start and say, hey, uh, I'm willing to pay your moving costs to get out and help you find a new place. And I'll put the time in to help you find some apartments and how much would you need to leave? And if you sign this document, once they sign it, they're gone, right? They're N11, N9. Get the N9 signed, it's more important than the N11, but I get them both signed. N9, super important in Ontario. They can't rescind that. So that's super, super important. Um, definitely want to, uh, okay, I'll make you a moderator too. No problem, Will. Okay, um, what was I gonna say? I lost my train of thought. I lost my train of thought. I was talking about cash for keys or something. Oh, right. Um, evicting tenants. So, uh, not evicting tenants, sorry. Uh, getting them out lawfully and having them willingly leave. I would say that a win is if the market rent, the prevailing market rent of the unit is, say, $1,000 a month, and the current unit is rented for $500, tenant paying $600 a month. This happens. Uh, then your spread there is huge, right? You have like a $1,400 spread. But let's just say it's $1,000 for easy numbers. Let's say you're renting for $600 a month, and it's worth $1,600 is market rent now you got $1,000 a month you're losing every month they stay there for market rent. So if you paid them $12,000 to leave, that might sound like a lot of money, 12 grand, if you have to pay three tenants, that's $36,000. You gotta pay them the three tenants to leave this triplex. Just made up a fictitious property. But to get them all to leave, $36,000 is a great investment because you're gonna get that back in one year. Put new tenants in there at market rent and in one year, you've gotten that money back. So if it's in less than a year, it's a great investment. Some people are even two years. So in that case, you could maybe pay $72,000 to get rid of three tenants uh, and get the markets, market rent up to what it should be, market rent. Uh, get the unit rent, sorry, up to market rent. So super important to do that. That's the calculation I would use. Uh, on top of that though, when you increase the rent, the building goes up substantially. A building with low rents has a low cap rate and may be worth several hundred thousand dollars less because of low paying tenants. So when you remove the low paying tenants and you get the market's rent up to that point and net operating income increases, not only do you get that money back in 12 months of cash flow increase now, but you also get a huge lift on the building. Typically, if you get those kinds of lifts, your building's probably gonna go up by two, three hundred thousand dollars in value as well. So you get that money back so quickly on your refinance or your sale that it just always makes sense to pay tenants out um, up to a year potentially to leave. It almost always makes sense. If market rent is much higher than what the tenant is currently paying, go give them cash for keys. It's a win-win. There are lots of other strategies you can use if they refuse to leave. Uh, there are lawful ways you could potentially change a unit and a substantially from say a one bedroom to a two bedroom and do a renovation with a permit and you can evict them doing a reno eviction and then anyway i won't get into some of the details but you can get a paralegal to help you through that but keys cash for keys is a great strategy to get out um a tenant it's a lawful way it's a win for the tenant the tenant gets an influx of cash they may have never even seen twelve thousand dollars in their life before all at one time do so you bring them twelve thousand dollars that's huge do not pay them until they leave uh, that's super important. I've paid their new landlord before, but I will not pay them until they have fully moved out. Um, that's just a policy that I have. When the moving truck's there and their stuff is out, money right there, there they go. They can have the money. Some people pay half when they sign the N9 and the N11, uh, and they pay half when they move out. Those kinds of strategies can be good, but they can try to rescind the N11. N9, they cannot back down on. 
Um, and I also would just take my phone out and take a picture while they're signing it. So they, can, they can't say they didn't sign it. They can't say it wasn't duress. I would sometimes turn my, you know, turn your phone on, try to record it, to make sure there's an agreement on the side stapled to it that says, hey, I'm giving you this amount of cash for your uh, agreeing to leave the property. Boom, done. All right, let's link up, guys. Looking forward to, to chatting again soon. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Appreciate everyone tonight, and I'll see you next week. Remember, the secret to unlocking a wealth through you is to spend less, earn more, and maximize returns in the difference. We'll uh, see you next week, guys. And as always, you know where to find me on social media, at my gross heart. Bye, everyone. Boom.